Hello, my name is John Schneider. When I was a kid, I used to visit my grandma Vi in the Jersey Bayshore area, and I'd take 8mm movies of my family and their friends. In fact, I was the family filmmaker. Today I live here, but traded my film camera for video, and recently shot this tugboat in the Shrewsbury River. Welcome to Jersey Bayshore Country. This is where you'll find Raritan Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, as well as Sandy Hook Bay. Where is the Jersey Bayshore? Let's get oriented by starting with the big picture. It's somewhere in here, part of the universe and definitely part of our world. But it's like no place I've ever experienced. And as soon as we land, I'll show you around. Hello everybody, this is John Schneider and welcome to Jersey Bayshore Country and our program all about Aeromarine Airways, a company which no longer exists and which most people don't even realize existed in Keyport, New Jersey. But before we begin our story, here's a side-by-side -side view of Keyport both yesterday and today. Keyport is a beautiful historic town on Raritan Bay where vestiges of the past are in fact still seen. Majestic old homes that are well maintained, mysterious pilings poking through the surface of the water, strange objects rising up through a sandy beach, or an old rusty water tower off in the distance. So let's start our story of Aeromarine long before it existed. Let's go back to the early 1700s when Keyport was first settled as primarily a plantation where lumber and produce were exported throughout the area. By 1830, this large plantation had evolved into a town which became a significant center for commerce and shopping. Let's imagine for a few minutes what life in Keyport in the early 1900s was like. That's Raritan Bay in the distance. The bay was always so important to the town's development, and it still is. Folks took pleasure in planning their recreational events on the local beach. A number of beautiful homes were built to take advantage of the view of Raritan Bay. In the small creeks which flowed through the town, you'd always find folks crabbing or fishing. And oysters were plentiful, and the hardiest of citizens spent their days on boats to harvest them. And some would take their boats out for pleasure when the wind filled their sails. Back on land, others were sorting, cleaning, or shucking oysters and clams for the local restaurants and townspeople. Harvesting oysters in Raritan Bay had become a significant part of the economy. The waterfront was mostly a dirty and gritty place where fishermen did their work. Oyster Creek was thriving with activity as bivalves were hauled from the ship's holds. The waterfront was always busy and boats were always coming in and out of port. Keyport also became a major player in shipbuilding, which were built during the Civil War. Keyport also became a major port for steamboats bringing passengers from New York, and also for exporting goods to other parts of the region. During this period, Keyport had become a bit of a so-called boomtown. So just look and imagine all the activity down by the waterfront. There was always something going on. Listen to the whistles of the steamships. 
After a storm or low tide, ships would sometimes become stuck in the shallows of mud. And in a few more minutes, we're going to talk about the Aero Marine factory, which is right over there. Keyport also formed one of the earliest yacht clubs on Raritan Bay. And it was not uncommon for folks to dress in their finest clothes, to stroll along the pier or have a picnic or go sailing on the bay. The docks, the ships, the oysters, I'm telling you, the people were mostly living the good life. Meanwhile, on the west side of Chingarora Creek, where you can see that water tower in the Lockport section of Keyport, a small company began experimenting with marine aeronautics. And that brings us to our story, except one more thing about Keyport, really about the entire Jersey Bay Shore. There is so much evidence of the past all around us. All you have to do is look. For example, look at this street in Keyport from the early 1900s, and now look at it today. It's almost the same. Let's take another look back at the early photograph. Here's another photograph from the past. It's the downtown of Keyport. Take a close look at the buildings as we switch to the present and then back to the past once more. Let's look at one more. It's another street in Keyport from the past, now the present, and then back to the past. These were mostly photographs from the early 1900s, and that's the period of time in which our story takes place. And this is not entirely filled with dates and facts and figures, but instead, it's just a glimpse into another time, another world. Now, as we swing back over to Raritan Bay, we're going to be looking at the prior location of a company called Aero Marine Airways. no longer exists. So look carefully at one of the tallest relics left of days gone by. It's the old Aero Marine water tower right in the middle of where some of the old factory buildings still stand. And here it is the site of a factory where history was made and some of it can still be seen. And here's Chingarora Creek, the eastern edge of Keyport and the eastern edge of the factory. And there's where the main structures of the factory were located. But the entire property all the way to the creek was filled with runways and other testing facilities these planes we're going to talk about. It was really the perfect location for a company experimenting with and manufacturing seaplanes. And here's an older photograph of the factory buildings as they once were. And this is where our story begins. Back in the day, as they say, Aero Marine was famous for what it did. It not only built seaplanes, but also ran an airline for passengers. One of their first successes, a seaplane which could fly from New York to Havana, Cuba, and return in 25 hours. They were part of every significant aeronautical exhibition. They not only built seaplanes, but regular planes as well with wheels. Artists were inspired to paint their planes. They were the cat's meow, and they began developing and manufacturing seaplanes for the United States military, which had gone to war against Germany in 1917. And the news media had their cameras focused on almost everything they did. Passengers, politicians, and celebrities were eager to climb aboard after having their photograph taken alongside one of the seaplanes. 
The company thrived during the peak of the First World War as it manufactured land planes, flying boats, engines, and propellers. It, it produced aircraft for the Navy beginning in 1917. Focusing on mail delivery, these aviation innovators successfully delivered mail to a ship at sea in 1919. It was a great time for Keyport because Aero Marine was so successful. They also operated between Key West and Cuba, New York and Havana, and Cleveland and Detroit. In 1923, they built the first all-metal flying boat in the United States. By 1928, the firm renamed itself Aero Marine Clem Corporation until the Great Depression forced its closure in 1930. Today, more than a hundred years after starting their business in Keyport, the sounds of airplanes taking off and landing from the company's runway are pretty much silent. But many of the buildings still stand where factory workers were organized to make some of the best airplanes in the world. Today, small businesses occupy some of the buildings. The entrance gate is a reminder of what this industrial park today once was. We've got some great old photographs in hand so that we can take a look at the past. So here we go. We're approaching the entrance to the factory. As we come in past the gates, we're going to pass the administration building, which is on our left, and it still stands today. And you can see, look, the Keyport waterfront is off in the distance. And here is the company's founder and fearless leader, Inglés M. Upperco, whose office would have been in this building, the administration building. And here, quite appropriately, is the company car. And here is the company bus, <laughs> which sometimes delivered workers from their homes to the factory and back again. And this newer bus, although nobody seems to know why it's shown in a circle, would take people, dignitaries, passengers, and customers to their departure area or take them inside the factory for a tour, like you can see right here. And here's the official organization chart for the company. And we're going to take a, a look at almost all of the departments in photographs represented in this chart in just a few minutes. Here's a look at one of the factory buildings from the east side of the property in 1914. And most of the photographs are from this general time frame. So let's go inside the factory and see what's happening. This is the shop where pontoons were made. Now the pontoons floated on the water on Raritan Bay or any other place where they landed in the water. Here's a view of the shop from the other side. And here's the shop where the hulls were made. The hulls were where the passengers would sit, so some were larger than others because they carried more passengers. Here's one of the hulls on its side inside the factory. And here's the engineering department where there were some very smart individuals drafting plans for the structure and mechanics of the planes. Who were these smart people? Well, here they are. Do you recognize anybody? And it may seem a strange name today, but here is something called the blacksmith shop. It's where metal was forged. Here's the machine shop. And this is the plating department, where metal would be plated with an alloy, like nickel or lead. There was also a print shop, where wings and the fuselage would get imprinted with logos, names, and numbers. 
And this is the place where the wooden propellers were made. Very important work. Also important, the motor assembly area which would turn the propellers. The motors received rave reviews from customers. But they had to be moved by wagon, like this one, because they were so darned heavy. Here's one of the chief mechanics at the factory. And here's the area where the final assembly occurred. The factory ran pretty well, according to most accounts. Everyone had their job, and there was no room for error. Only one fatality occurred in the history of the company, and it was the result of a mechanical failure of one of the planes during the company's entire history. Now, once the planes were assembled, they were taken outside to be tested and flown. Here's the runway, which extended from the administration building off to the right down there, and it, it went all the way to the end of the point. If it was a regular plane with wheels, it took off from this runway. Now here are two Aeromarine pilots who are about to deliver a new plane to Latin American Airlines. Just outside one of the hangars, there used to be a pond with water in it in which the seaplane pontoons could be tested before going out onto Raritan Bay. In its day, Aeromarine designed and built a variety of aircraft. It must have been really interesting for local residents in Keyport to see so many different types of planes taking off and landing from this place. The factory, which had about 130,000 square feet of factory floor space, employed about 1,200 people. And many of those people lived right here in Keyport or in the surrounding area. Oh, one more thing about Aeromarine, which a lot of people don't know. It was their involvement with the Navy in being the first to land a plane on an aircraft carrier in Raritan Bay that really clinched the deal with the military. It was the USS Langley in 1922. Lieutenant Commander Chevalier made the first landing on the Langley deck in 1922. For the next few years, Navy pilots and the Langley crew worked hard to master the complex techniques for handling both the carrier and her planes. but we learned to land on her deck. 
The early 1920s also saw the development of catapults, a resting gear, a faster elevator to clear the flight deck, safe fuel handling techniques, a landing light system, and all the other hardware needed to launch and land to refuel and maintain aircraft at sea. Unfortunately, eight years later, Aero Marine would be closed forever. Today, the building and the relics strewn about the property are only a reminder of another time. Now, this is not a tourist attraction or any place you can easily visit. Like so many things at the Jersey Bay Shore, it really sits on the edge of yesterday. The water tower, a proud reminder of the innovation and determination of our ancestors to make a world better for all of us. Who would have ever thought back in those days that we'd become what we've become? When I walk the landscape of the Jersey Bay Shore, I can't help but feel the spirits of that other world so long ago where people could only dream about their future. Little did they know we'd be thinking of them now. This place and these buildings are the tombstones of an ancient technology. Inside, people slightly different than us were frustrated with failure and exhilarated with achievement. They delighted in seeing their company rise up literally into the air. Now, many of them have left us. Today, the airfield is overgrown with trees and weeds. I recently invited my friend and photographer Paul Scharf to photograph some of the natural beauty of the area. Every once in a while, we'd see a relic on the ground, which kind of looked like an airplane part, but who knows? And is this a pipe to an underground fuel container? Again. Who knows? Can you see them? Can you hear their engines overhead? Can you feel their joy and all that they were so happy to achieve so long ago? I hope so.
uh, my name is Stephen Rethoff. I'm uh, a, a veteran of uh, many years of uh, Air Force, but uh, in the early uh, uh, 50s, after um, a short stint of flying uh, in interceptors, uh, I uh, spent three and a half years at Montauk Point, end of Long Island, in the 773rd AC&W Aircraft Control and Warning Unit, which um, uh, covered uh, quite a bit of New Jersey also. Uh, we are the uh, Aviation Hall of Fame and Museum of New Jersey, state designated as a, a specific New Jersey uh, aviation Museum. We're right at Teterboro Airport, uh, which is uh, up in Bergen County. Our uh, greatest effort and our greatest pleasure is um, hosting school groups, uh, scout groups. New Jersey has a tremendous history that a lot of people don't recognize. We have, for example, 15 astronauts uh, that we've identified from New Jersey. Some of uh, them very uh, visible and important guys like uh, Wally Shira, who was active with our museum at one point. Um, uh, Buzz, Buzz uh, Aldrin, um, uh, who flew uh, a moon mission. Uh, that's Edwin Aldrin Jr. He's in our Hall of Fame and so is Edwin Aldrin Sr. Uh, the, the quite unknown. He was a World War II aviator who immediately after the war became the director of Newark Airport when it was growing explosively. 